Hi, and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. This video is part of a series of videos where I review every film in the Star Trek franchise, every Star Trek film, one week at a time. In this video, I will cover Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. So, I'm not going to beat around the bush, we'll just go right out and say this, generally speaking, is considered the best Star Trek film ever made. If you uh, pretty much, I mean, there's some outliers, of course, here and there who choose other movies, but generally speaking, if you look up any, like, top ten list or best Star Trek movie list, this would be at the top. But, more than that, this isn't just one of the, this isn't just considered one of the best Star Trek movies of all time, or even the best sci-fi movies of all time. It's actually considered one of the best movies of all time. In fact, if you look up a list of the best 80s movies, this will likely make that list as well. So this is considered one of the best films in its own right. Uh, and it's also, when you look at, uh, when people mention classic films of the 80s, uh, like E.T. or Ghostbusters or, you know, Empire Strikes Back. This film is also typically mentioned along with those films and considered one of the great classic films that came out in the 80s uh, and sort of transcends not just the Star Trek label but the sci-fi label as well to be a classic 80s film. Now, the thing with The Wrath of Khan, though, is most of this high praise in general speaking is sort of in retrospect because when the film was first released it actually didn't make that much money it was overshadowed by films like E.T. that came out at the same time if you can believe that uh, so it wasn't it gained more steam and much like the Star Trek show itself it gained more steam and syndication and once it went to video and whatnot, and people looking. Now, the critic response was always very positive about this film from the very beginning, uh, but it took a little while for the fans to sort of warm up to it, but generally speaking, it is considered uh, the best Star Trek film of all time. Now, my personal experience, I'm going to put this right out there too. This is what made me a Star Trek fan, this film. Before I saw this film, I did not like Star Trek. I used to make fun of my mother for watching Star Trek, and I thought it was just something dumb. Um, so this film came out when I was three years old. Apparently, I was told that my mother took me there as a three-year-old, but of course I had no memory of that. <laughs> so my first memory of actually seeing it was in the late 1990. So I was like 11 years old, I think. Um, and my brother... Uh, who you know from his channel, African Tomko, uh, just decided out of the blue, hey, uh, I want to watch Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. And I was like, alright, fine, I got nothing better to do. So I watched it and I was blown away. Completely blown away. I was like, holy crap. That <laughs> is was awesome. So then uh, I later got out all my, um, I did like a marathon where I watched all five, there were five at this point, Star Trek films in a row, and of course I got to the five, and I was like, yeah. but, <laughs> but, um, the thing is, I actually remember seeing four and five in the theaters, um, but I didn't remember one, two, or three, uh, so that, so I saw them, watched them all, for the first time, and then I had, well, I had to watch the original series now, so I went back and started watching reruns of the original series, and that led to watching episodes of The Next Generation, when Star Trek VI came out, and then, there you go, I'm a full-fledged Trekkie, or Trekker, I don't really give a shit, but <laughs> I was a full-fledged Star Trek fan, thanks to this film, this is the film that really got me into Star Trek, and I've been hugely into Star Trek ever since. Uh, and I used to watch this film repeatedly when I was in high school, when I was like maybe middle school more, like 13, 14 years old. I would come home from school and watch this film, <laughs> like almost like a ritual. So I've seen this film like probably over 200 times, maybe more. Um, I didn't do that every day. For a while I was doing it, I was, you know, 
My brother's got sort of sick. Oh, God, you gonna watch this film again? I just put it on as background noise and not even pay attention to it. That's just how much I love this film. I have absolutely considered it uh, my one of my favorite films or my favorite film of all time at that stage. Um, since not so much, but I still consider this one of the best films uh, ever to come out of the 80s and one of the best science fiction films and definitely the best Star Trek film. So, it's interesting when you get into the backstory of how this film got made because in, I covered the motion picture last week and the motion picture actually, if you look at the box office results, it made more money than this film. And because it actually made, it did well financially. Success, it was a financial success but it was a critical and audience failure. The critics and the audience did not like it. They were very disappointed. It wasn't the type of film they were expecting. It was more of a you know slow based, music based, art artsy film, kind of like 2001. When that's not what people were expecting from a Star Trek film, especially in the era of Star Wars, they was expecting it to be more like Star Wars, or at the very least, uh, hold the same sort of adventure feel that the original series had and the same sort of character feel and so um they sort of kicked out all the creative team of the motion picture to make the star trek sequel and they hired uh first time or early you know rookie producer i would say he was at the beginning of his career harv bennett and harv bennett in interviews had described that the Star Trek franchise at this stage, even though it was only like a year or two after the motion picture came out, he described the Star Trek franchise as a beached whale. Many people thought that the Star Trek franchise was dead because of the critical and audience failure of the, the motion picture, even though it made a lot of money. Um, the response was so negative they thought that the Star Trek uh, franchise was dead. Now, but because it made a lot of money, that proved to the studios that the thirst was still there for the Star Trek film. Like, people would go out and pay money to see a Star Trek film. That was proven even after the poor <laughs> word of mouth had still made a decent amount of money. So I think that convinced the studio to make a sequel. Uh, but uh, they were kind of weary about it, so this is really a test, and so it had a much, much lower budget than the motion picture did. Um, and they hired, like, mostly rookies who weren't that experienced to work on it, like uh, Harv Bennett was put in charge of it, and Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry was kicked upstairs, and he was pretty much locked out of this filmmaking he was very critical of it even after the film was released he was he um was very vocal about his um disapproval of this film which kind of makes you wonder because it is so much better than it is the most like i saw one review it was like this takes you back to the classics of gene roddenberry's original series and it's funny to say it like that because gene roddenberry was very much against this film <laughs> and what he wanted to do was the motion picture which many people didn't like so that's interesting to think about it uh in those terms um so harv bennett uh he didn't know so he was put in charge of star trek 2 and he didn't know anything about star trek so he went and binged I don't know, they didn't use that term back in the 80s, but essentially, he binged the entire original series, which he hadn't seen before, but he studied it carefully, and I, I give a lot of credit for him, because and I think it's almost a good idea to get someone with fresh eyes, someone who's not attached to the franchise, like Roddenberry, to come in and just watch it all at the first time and say, what kind of movie should be made from this show? And so what he latched on to was the Kirk Spock McCoy dynamic, which is a pretty obvious thing to latch on to. I think it makes all the sense in the world. So he thought that any film, any Star Trek film, should play off of that, that, that dynamic of the three of them. And they didn't feel that the motion picture did, which it didn't really. It had some banter between them, but it didn't. that wasn't really the focus. So he wanted to make a new Star Trek film, that be the focus of the three of them. And also, of course, he saw Space Seed and saw that um, 
like the villain of Khan. Now, one of Gene Roddenberry's notes, actually, one of the things they did take on board for him was they wanted to have a good villain for this film. So Harv Bennett took that, you know, uh, into consideration and watched the original series and said, hey, this is a great actor, Ricardo Montalban, playing this great villain. He seems like the biggest foil, the kind of equal to Kirk. He's more of a human. He's not like this alien super being or whatever. But they're sort of this would allow for a very good battle of wits. And the other thing is that uh, he wanted Leonard Nimoy again was saying that he wasn't going <laughs> to do a Star Trek sequel again because it was hard to get him for the motion picture and he's still insisting that he doesn't want to do Star Trek again. So to entice him, uh, Harv Bennett said, well, what if we give you a great death scene? Uh, and that, uh, and of course, as an actor, that enticed Leonard Nimoy, so he agreed to do it. Now, it was got misconstrued later on that um, he um, he had it in his contract that he had to die in the film in order to do it, which he uh, Leonard Nimoy denies that being the case because that's not technically the case, but. It seems apparent that he probably wouldn't have agreed to do it if Harp Har Bennett didn't entice him with the uh, with the death scene because he was you know this is still the era of I am not Spock <laughs> when he's very much trying to distance himself um, from Star Trek but he thought well this would be a great send off for the character and plus he was sure he was positive that this would be the last Star Trek film because there's no way they were going to make any more Star Trek films this would be the end of Star Trek so he thought well why not give my character a proper send-off. So Harv Bennett wrote a couple of drafts of scripts with uh, which Leonard Nimoy didn't like. Those drafts had uh, Spock dying and like at the start of the film. And so uh, one of Harv Bennett's uh, assistants or friends with someone he works with put him in touch. Hey, why don't you get in touch with this upcoming director? And he uh, he could probably help you out. So that's how he contacted Nicholas Meyer. Nicholas Meyer came in and told uh, Leonard Nimoy that he'd rewrite the script. He agreed with Nimoy that the script wasn't good and it needed to be better. He said he'd totally rewrite it within six days, and then six days later he came up with what we now know as Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And uh, Nimoy was very impressed, and so was Shatner, so they, so they all agreed to do it, and there we go. We got Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. So it was interesting because most of the, as I said, because it had such a low budget, most of the people working, like Nicholas Meyer, and I think this was the first movie he directed. Like, he worked in other films before in other areas, but I think this was his first. Maybe he directed one that didn't turn out very well. But <laughs> this was, like, his first sort of big movie uh, directing and Harv Bennett was new and then they had a, a composer who I'll get to more later on um, James Horner this was his first film as well so unlike the motion picture which had a huge budget had huge names like Bob Weiss and all that um, this had a much smaller budget so it was a lot more compact so it was more focused on it was less focused on these expensive visual effects and more focused on these, you know, claustrophobic character stories. And that actually, I think, helped the film a lot. Now, while they were filming, apparently, Nimoy was realizing, and Howard Bennett, were, and they were realizing how good this movie was turning out to be. And Nimoy's mind was totally, you know, changed, when, you know, after starting filming is like this is going to be a really great film so then they started to realize that this probably is not going to be the last star trek film because this film's really good they're probably going to want more so then they started to change their minds about spock's death uh they never floated the idea apparently but apparently like nimoy was thinking was having second thoughts about killing off spock and maybe was thinking about changing it, but of course the script was already made, and the film was already dependent on Spock dying, so what they did, he, Nemo and Harv Bennett apparently, while they were filming, came up with that bit where Spock goes, remember, and gives uh, McCoy the mind mouth sort of as an out. Uh, to try to say, ooh, Spike might, Spock might be back in the next film, which, of course, we know he was. Now, and um, 
the uh, and apparently they they had the film originally ended with the funeral scene you know this funeral scene where they're playing Amazing Grace and you know Kirk is you know uh, being he was the most human apparently the film ended there and it, and it screened very poorly with test audiences test audience uh, apparently left the film very sort of stoic and not really liking it so they added a few scenes uh, one of them being the you know the showing the torpedo landing on the planet and having Leonard Nimoy doing the you know the big Star Trek monologue at the end and Harv Bennett said that those scenes were specifically put in there to indicate that Spock would return so basically by this stage they had already made up their minds that they were going to bring Spock back to life uh, so that was trying to be and Harv Bennett said that oh having Leonard do the monologue made it clear that he was going to be back although that wasn't my take when, it, when I first saw the film, even though I already knew that it was coming back because Star Trek Search for Spock was already a thing. But yeah, but that wasn't my take on that monologue. I, th I saw it more as a, you know, uh, a eulogy, as a send-off to this character. Not necessarily an indication that he would return, but apparently that was the intention <laughs> behind it. Uh, so, uh, that was very very interesting now I I think yeah so getting into more of my opinion on this film I think watching it again I do realize because I've always said to myself this is the best Star Trek film because from memory I always love this film and then there's always the danger of course of getting the nostalgia and letting that drive why you like a film so that's why I like to rewatch films I say I love every once in a while to make sure that's still how I feel. Although, again, you have the other consideration of once you watch it too many times you get a bit sick of it. <laughs> but, I, it's been a while since I've seen this. So I watched it again and I am sort of like analyzing it. Like, you know. And I was like blown away by how perfect this film seems to be paced. And I can totally understand why I was so enamored with this film in the first place, why it made me a Star Trek fan, and why so many other people put this film, uh, hold this film in high regard. Because it is crafted perfectly. And I think that is very interesting that all the, you know, the people behind the scenes were new and, and didn't have much experience. Because I think they, at this stage, still had a lot to prove. And they so they wanted to make a career from themselves, so they were legitimately trying their best to make a good film. Where I think maybe some you get sometimes you get seasoned directors in there that just like oh, this is another paycheck, whatever, because they already have their dues, they just go in and do the film, whatever. I mean, not saying they don't put any effort into it, but I think when you have these young minds who are trying to prove themselves, that makes them put even the biggest effort, and you can tell a lot of care was uh, given and it also speaks to Nicholas Meyer's talent that he was able to just make such a good script and then execute it in such an amazing way that he he knew pretty much exactly how to do it now so so what makes this movie so great is that not just like the action or whatever but it's it's more the adventure story that people wanted with the first Star Trek film. That's why a lot of people were disappointed in the motion picture. Uh, they wanted an, a Star Wars-like adventure, but feeling more Star Trek and more true to what made the original series great. So it's a great film for both like people who had never heard of Star Trek and for old Star Trek fans. And I think this was the perfect way to do it. Not just like for back then, but it has never been done as well since as i say it's the best star trek movie they had never pulled off this perfect blend of action adventure character stories which is a very important element they had a really great through character stories with kirk feeling having a, a midlife crisis basically uh where he's not at he's not necessarily too old at this stage but he's feeling older than he was before and he's feeling a bit 
used up because he's, you know, Admiral sitting behind the desk and not doing what he truly wants to do, which is go out and command a starship. And they have, and of course, they have that Spock McCoy uh, Kirk dynamic that um, Howard Bennett was talking about, where you get great scenes with McCoy, you know, talking to that Kirk about how, you know, it's ridiculous for him to feel useless and how he needs to get his command back. And you have Spock giving him the the uh, Tale of Two Cities book as a birthday present, which apparently has deeper meaning, even though he says it doesn't. <laughs> and just the way this all comes together, along with, um, you know, Khan. And the Khan storyline isn't, like, out of place. It works into these storylines. And Kirk, uh, through his confrontations with Khan, realizes that he's still useful. Now... <sighs> One scene that really uh, stuck out to me when on this rewatch is because I know before I'd always focus on Spock's death, which I'll get to shortly, because that was always a really kind of the crowning achievement in, cin in cinema, in my opinion. But when I focus more on other parts, I realized that the the through story even before Spock's death was executed amazingly well. And one scene in particular that really hit me was when Kirk was on the, you know, regular one, the lifeless asteroid, and uh, he'd been down uh, with, uh, you know, McCoy, Savick, and um, Chekhov, and Tyrell, and then, of course, Chekhov and Tyrell were, you know, brainwashed by Khan, so they cornered them uh, with guns, and Khan was up on the red line telling them to kill Captain Kirk. But, you know, Terrell, and this is just an amazing scene from start to finish because you could, and they had um, Paul Winfield who played Terrell. Was, I've seen him in other things, nonetheless being Darm Rock on TNG. But he was amazing in this scene because you could tell, and just in examining acting, you can tell that he was playing Terrell as someone who was trying to fight the brainwashing like the brainwashing was telling him to kill Kirk and so he was a slave to that and couldn't fight it but he was trying to fight it at the same time and eventually the compromise was to kill himself rather than to kill Kirk that was amazingly intense so and that was done so well and then of course you get the classic scene after you know Terrell kills himself and check off screams when the, the eel comes out um Kirk, you know, talks to Khan and has an epic, you know, combat where Khan's like, um, oh, I've done far worse than kill you. I've hurt you and I wish to go on hurting you. And then he screams the line, Khan, you know, Khan, which of course has become a classic moment in cinema, not just among Star Trek fans, but in cinema generally. And of course, this was trying to replicate it into darkness and I'll get more into that later but is a and it's a classic moment for a reason because they really earned it it wasn't just him screaming con and anger like in into darkness really where it wasn't really earned here that whole scene was slowly building that tension with the mind control Terrell and Kirk is the first hand of the death that Khan is causing uh, to try it all in the name of revenge against him. And Kirk has just had enough of it, and he wants to duel. He wants to get it over with. If you're grudge with me, go ahead and kill me. Go ahead and come down here. Just let's get this over with. But Khan's like, no, no. I like hurting you, and I want to hurt you even more. And that lends to the, the big scream. Now, the scream also, even though I do believe it was totally genuine, because Kirk was just sick of Khan killing off people to get to him. But it's also kind of meant as deceptive. It's kind of a fake out, too, because earlier, you know, they had that code between Kirk and Spock about the uh, hours would seem like days, which I think is a dead giveaway code. Khan's smart. He should have picked up on that. But anyway, I mean, why else would Spock say hours would seem like days? But anyway, uh, where... They fooled Khan into thinking that uh, the Enterprise would be disabled for days when really it was hours. So the yelling of the Khan was also meant to 
it was kind of a fake out to think, oh, you str you have stranded me here and I'm, I'm going to be stuck here for days, which Kirk knew was bullshit. So it's part sincere, part to deceive him, and it worked. And I love that. I just, that whole scene was so intense. And that's not to shortchange some of the other sequences in the film, especially the Mutara Nebula uh, sequence, which was a very classic a uh, submarine chase film but done in space it was that was really blew me away about this film it was so intense so engaging you could tell this is what nicholas meyer brought to the film because he was sort of more basing it off of these submarine films or uh, swashbuckling films and stuff like that and this was the kind of adventure that fans were yearning for from from a star trek movie so that's why this movie delivered in every way and it say it did save the franchise because they wouldn't have got like Lennon Newman said we wouldn't have had a Star Trek three or Star Trek four Star Trek five or Star Trek six without this film we wouldn't have Next Generation if uh, we didn't get those other films which was due to this film so this basically the Star Trek franchise would have been dead we wouldn't have any of this million Deep Space Nine Voyager Discovery all this stuff wouldn't exist if it wasn't for this film. And there's a reason why it holds up so well, um, because it was really done that well. Now, another interesting aspect of this film was they introduced Kirk's son, which I think was an original story idea. It was in the original scripts as well. And I heard some of the ideas for it, and it wasn't done very well. So thank God uh, Nicholas Meyer came in and uh, used it very well. Because it's done in a really... Uh, interesting way because we're introduced to these two characters David and Carol Marcus earlier in the film and we find out that uh, Carol Marcus and Kirk knew each other and they had a romance in the past and there's still a sore spot for Kirk but we didn't know David was Kirk's son until like halfway through the film around the same time of the scene I was just talking about so that was pretty well done it was slowly disseminated in fact David didn't really realize this himself until later and to have the film end after Spock's death with you know David saying I'm very proud to be your son it was a very t it was the best way they could have handled the Kirk son storyline because yeah you look at some of these earlier drafts you can see some very bad ways they could have done it and there's other films too where they introduced like a long lost son and it's just like oh that's silly that's dumb but this this the slow way they just worked it into the story and it got you used to the character first and it made it make total sense it really did work now I'll get more into this next week but to them, after doing such a great introduction to the son, to just kill him off in the next film, it was kind of a cop-out, but as I said, I'll cover that more next week. Anyway, I gotta talk about, this is probably my favorite musical score of all time. And in fact, I think the musical score is what really enhanced, because a lot of people talk about, and I even got a few comments last week about the motion picture, how it has a really good musical score. And nothing against uh, the motion picture of Jerry Goldsmith. Although, I, to be honest, I didn't like Jerry Goldsmith's scores for the Next Generation films, which I'll get it. I think he was the poor choice for those films. But I'll get more into that when I get into the Next Generation films. But for the motion picture, he did do a really good job. And he, of course, spawned the, you know... Uh, theme that would be used as the main theme for the next generation but to me and I've even heard some opinions recently saying they wish they would have had Jerry Goldsmith for this film as well but I could not disagree more to me the James Horner score for this was the single best score I have ever heard I should say in any movie ever is still my number one all-time favorite score it was just unique it, was, it worked so well. It had that swashbuckling feel that uh, Nicholas Myers won, but it's still in sort of a space opera way. Like this movie, I think if you took out the score and watched this without music or watch it with like a lesser score, then I think the movie would not be as awesome as it is. I really do think the music 
adds so much and it's just so poignant like just I mean, this is one of the things that make this one of the best films of all time. Because just watching it last night and seeing, like, for example, when uh, after Khan attacks the Enterprise and Spock is pointing out the damage and, and you see he's pointing to this diagram that shows the parts of the ship that were damaged and you hear the score come up going, has specific cues, like every time Spock points, he matches it and goes, done. Done, done. So that really enhances like what would kind of be not a boring scene but a bit tedious part of the battle but it makes it more intense and of course the whole sequence with the two ships going through the nebula the score does so much to, under, to make that so intense and so awesome and then at the end during Spock's death it was such a beautiful score especially when they're you know uh, after they shoot Spock's body out in that sequence with the torpedo on the planet. Absolutely beautiful. And of course, they pretty much continue the score for the next film, which is also done amazingly well. So, James Horner, I always consider my favorite uh, composer just, just for this. But then he did on to do other films in the 80s, most notably Aliens. Uh, and if you watch Aliens, and f like the first time I saw Aliens, um, which was also, it was actually much later, it was like the late 90s, so I was a bit late on that one movie too, but the first time I watched Aliens, I was like, I immediately recognized the Star Trek II score, because <laughs> the scores are actually very similar. Uh, so I don't know if that you could call that a knock against Horner, that he pretty much did the same sort of, well I wouldn't say the same score it was the same baseline but he's changed it altered it slightly like some of the musical yeah like the musical cue in Aliens I was like oh my god that's Wrath of Khan but then it went off in a slightly different direction but I could tell it's the same guy but of course he's probably most well known for doing James Cameron films and more like recent years where he did Titanic and and I think Avatar if I if I remember correctly um, unfortunately he's passed away now but I, I do believe he did Avatar before he passed away um, and he won Academy Award for doing Braveheart and Braveheart that's a totally different kind of score like I had the Braveheart soundtrack on uh, CD because that was one of my favorite films as well and that's I couldn't even recognize uh, it was James Horner, but it was. So he is one of the most influential, like, classic uh, music uh, movie composers of all time, in my opinion. And I think, and this was his first film, as I said, and it was just shows how <laughs> lucky they are to get to, you know, because they were working with basic unknowns, and they ended up with someone who would basically be the greatest, one of the greatest movie composers. But anyway. Let me talk more about Spock's death and why I think this really worked. Because there are many other, not just talking about the stupid, you know, emulations, which I'll get to shortly, but also like other films that try to kill off a main character and make a big deal out of it. They all sort of pale into comparison to this one. This, the way this film captured it, I think, is by far the best that any film has ever done because they managed to foreshadow it greatly like by having focusing on the Kirk Spock relationship first of all was really well done and um, just having you know Spock say earlier in the film needs the many outweigh the needs of the few and I have been always shall be your friend and then to have them repeat those words but have more meaning uh, at the end it was just so powerful it just really underscored the whole and plus like the theme and this is why this movie is like such a masterpiece in terms of construction like the theme of having the no win scenario and starting the film with the training exercise of the Kobayashi Maru and then having uh, at the end there being a no win scenario with Spock and Spock having and because they had already realized that they were going to kill Spock but that was the perfect way to do it 
uh, was to tie it back where he and not it was not only a no win scenario for Spock, it was no win scenario for Kirk. And I love how they even point this out that uh, when David comes to him, he even says, "You've never because Kirk's whole thing throughout the film was, oh, I don't believe in a no win scenario, and he's been to seem like tough and like a badass, and that's how 2009 plays it, which why wow, that maybe sucks. But anyway, <laughs> um, it sort of slaps him down though, saying that he's wrong." That there is such a thing as a no-win scenario, and here it is. And you see him have to deal with that. So David even points this out to him. He says, you never dealt with a uh, no-win scenario before this. And Kirk has to admit, no, I haven't. And you see this amazing sort of character revelation in, in this. And especially the scene when he's on the bridge with McCoy and Carol watching the uh, torpedo go to the Genesis planet. It was absolutely beautiful because when he says, uh, he realizes that he quotes the Tale of Two Cities and saying, this is something Spock was trying to tell me on my birthday, and asks him, how do you feel? He says, young, I feel young. I think that was a very well earned because he feels young for the, for, for the first time because he's realizing he's how to embrace life and how important life is, and he's realizing uh, that he did in fact, have to deal with a no-win scenario for the first time in his life. So, <laughs> this, just the whole way you played out was absolutely amazing. Now, now's the time where I think I'm going to have to get into the, briefly, into these future emulations. Because the most common, well-known, you know, emulations of this uh, film is Star Trek Nemesis and uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. There's a... The two films people point to the most. Now, Star Trek Nemesis pretty much copied the, the same format of uh, this film. I, I wouldn't say... I disagree with some people. Some people say the entire movie. I don't think it was the entire movie. I think certainly the aspect of having a villain uh, be the main like thing, the drive between the conflict between the main captain and the villain. and But more importantly, they try to emulate, you know, Shinzon blowing it when Picard defeats his ship, Shinzon wants to blow up the ship with the Doomsday device, which will kill the Enterprise, and their warp drive isn't going. Uh, so, you know, they need to get away or something. So, in this case, Data beams aboard um, Shinzon's ship and blows up the device before it can go off, rather than saving the warp engines. But the result, and sacrificing himself, but it's very obvious that the result the same. And I'll get more into this one again to Nemesis, but that was such a pale condition comparison data's death was handled so poorly especially you put it back to back with spock's death here it was just like it felt rushed it was unnecessary <coughs> it really highlights how well it was done here and as i said it's not just that movie pretty much a lot of movies that try to kill main characters none of them i think it did it as well as uh uh, this film did and of course there's you know into darkness which was very overt about ripping off Khan because they were doing Khan and they did the same scenario with you know uh, save, saving the warp engine so the, uh, the, so the ship can uh, not be destroyed but they swapped roles and they had Kirk do it and instead of Spock and then after Kirk dies Spock yells Khan and you know obvious callback to the whole Kirk yelling Khan here now again I'll get more into that when I cover Into Darkness but, again, it's kind of a pale comparison, but to me that's a bit more excusable because the whole Star Trek reboot thing seems like kind of a cover band to me in the first place, and this was like this parallel universe, so they were showing like a parallel version of it, so that kind of made sense to me, a parallel universe, it would, this would be a slightly different but similar uh, way, you know, the events go down, even though, like, Intellectually, we know that's just, just a movie company ripping off Wrath of Khan and trying to copy it. Um, but it's actually a bit slightly more excusable to me because of, you know, this the whole parallel universe uh, concept. But then, it again, it wasn't as well executed, nowhere near as well executed as it was in the Wrath of Khan. It felt forced and it felt kind of like an homage. But here's the thing. A lot of people point to those two films. Most people actually just point to Into Darkness and not realizing that Nemesis is just as bad. But people point to these two films not realizing that pretty much every single Star Trek film since 1994 
has been trying to rip off the Wrath of Khan from Star Trek Generations to Star Trek 2009. They all base their film on a villain out for revenge. And that basic premise was um, from, yeah, from Star Trek 2. Now, even if, if you were watching, like, the press releases and stuff for all of the Next Generation films, for Generations First Contact, uh, Insurrection, Nemesis, all of them said, this is a villain about the main villain. This is a main villain to rival Khan. So they weren't hiding the fact that they were trying to recreate Khan. They were trying to recapture Khan. And that's what I think is a mistake. I think the reason why Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan is such an amazing film is not because it copied other Star Trek. It didn't copy Space Seed. It was totally different than Space Seed. It took that grain that was introduced in Space Seed but came up with something new and original. And I think that was the mistake. They kept trying to recapture uh, what has been done in this film instead of doing something original. And I think a lot of people overlook uh, the other films, other not just Nemesis and Into Darkness, but especially Star Trek 2009. Its villain Nero, I think, was in fact the worst attempt to copy Khan out of all of them. He was a, a two-dimensional, cliche, empty villain who's just going around, oh, and his quest for revenge made no sense whatsoever. So to me, that is actually the worst ripoff of Wrath of Khan, not Into Darkness, not fucking Nemesis, but Star Trek 2009. But again, I'll get more into this when I cover those films. Anyway, uh, I do have to end my, speaking of Khan, uh, I have to end this review talking about the character of Khan because many people do say he is the best Star Trek villain of all time. To me, it doesn't hold a candle to Goldcott, but, and even Q I would put higher. But, uh, <laughs> so that gives to my next point is that I do think Khan is over, overrated a bit. I mean, this has to do with the fact that I didn't care for Space Seed as an episode. I thought it was, I didn't think it was bad. It was fine, but I didn't think it was like one of the best episodes, like many people hold it up as like a classic top 10. Original series episode, to me, it doesn't nearly qualify for that. It was a decent episode, but it wasn't great. And I didn't think Khan was that particularly great. So if if it were me, if I was in charge of coming up with uh, a character to from the original series, a villain to make a film out of, I would have chose Garth of Izar. I think he would have made a much more compelling interesting villain, but of course the actor who portrayed him was, had sadly passed away um, by 1982 and Ricardo Montalban was a huge star, so that made the choice kind of simple <laughs> that it would be Khan. But if the situation were reversed and uh, the actor who played Garth Visar became a huge star, maybe we'd get a Wrath of uh, Garth. <laughs> sounds like Wayne Wayne's World reference. But <laughs> but um, I think that uh, I personally would be more interested in that. But, you know, that's this just the way things go. So, but, and here's the thing about Khan, is that I think, since this is Wrath of Khan, and is one of the be is the best Star Trek movie, and one of the best, like, classic 80 movies period I think a lot of people conflate having a good movie with having the best villain don't get me wrong Khan really works in this film and as I was just getting into like this particular scenes with him and Kirk clashing it out really make this but I think that has more to do <clears throat> with the excellent writing and execution of the film rather than the character himself, if you follow me. So, like, I think they could insert any villain, like Garth, Garth of Izar, and the film would have been just as good. Uh, I don't think Khan is particularly special or integral, as opposed to someone like Dukat or Q, who are irreplaceable. If you take them out and try to put someone else in, the whole story just falls apart. Where I think with Khan, it's more of the fact that the movie was great, and the script was good rather than 
the villain being all that particularly good. And so my opinion is that a lot of people conflate having a good film with having a great villain. And that's another reason why I'm not really into them trying to emulate and copy Khan a dozen times before because it isn't really that great in the first place. It was just the fact that the film was good and you should try to come up with something original because anything that just emulates or copies something else too closely. I mean, obviously, a lot of great works take inspiration from classics, but if you just copy it one for one, and it's so obvious, like a nemesis or Into Darkness or even 2009, it's gonna, it's gonna fail, and there's no way it could be ever be as good as the original, so don't even try. So anyway, my rating for Star Trek II uh, the Wrath of Khan is, out of 10, is of course, of course, it's a 10 the best. Really amazing film. It was just beautifully constructed. It's what got me into Star Trek. Even watching it now when I'm older and wiser, I can see more of why this is such a great film. How the character stories interweave perfectly with the action and adventure that one would want to see out of Star Trek rather than a slow-paced artsy film like the motion picture tried to be. So this is the perfect Star Trek film and it really works. So that's it for my review of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. I will be back here in a week for my review of Star Trek III The Search for Spock. And after that, I will continue down the line to review every movie up until I get to Star Trek Beyond. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, you can check out my channel for all that, as well as many more Star Trek videos, as well as other videos on shows like The Expanse, Game of Thrones, Babylon 5, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.